This is the Greg Bedard Patriots Podcast with Nick Cavins. He's Greg. I'm Nick. It's the Greg Bedard Patriots podcast with Nick Cattles. Boy, oh boy, we've got mandatory minicamp. Something to actually talk about, not OTAs. No, no pads, nothing crazy just yet, but mm-hmm. uh, getting closer to actual football. And of course, Greg was out there today to witness everything. Let's jump right into it, Greg. I saw on Twitter all morning long, all day long, uh, there's a change at offensive tackle. Looks like Trent Brown was playing the left side. Isaiah Wynn was playing the right side. Uh, Were you surprised? And what do you think it means? Yeah, so we got out there at practice today. And, and of course, everybody immediately was like, all right, where's number 76? And uh, Trent Brown was not out there to start practice, which was his string. He has been dealing with something, which uh, (laughs) isn't great, uh, considering it seems like he's always dealing with something. Um, You know, but once they started practice, it was Yadni Kajust at left tackle when Trent Brown was not out there. And then there was Isaiah Wynn at right tackle, a place he I've never seen him take a snap at in practice or anything. And so that was surprising. Trent Brown eventually came out and I would say he was he was kind of sort of splitting time with Yadni Kajust at left tackle that it seemed like they didn't want to overdo it with Trent Brown. But uh, Isaiah went at right tackle. Very, very interesting that they decided to go this route. Um, maybe they just want to take a look at it over this mandatory mini camp, and then they'll reassess. And I think you could put a lot of things like the offense, like what are they going to do on offense? And you could say, hey, they might just be getting a look at some things right now. And then once the coaches convene here after these practices are over before summer break, they sort of say, okay, this is what we want to do when we go to training camp. Did we like Isaiah Wynn on the right side or do we want to go back? Do we want to run Shanahan's zone scheme more of that or not? You know, so that kind of experimentation can go on. But Isaiah Wynn on the right side, interesting. Um, You know, if you were to script something for him to be possibly out of town at some point, you would say, all right, yeah, we're going to go forward with a different left tackle. And, uh, you know, at yep. right tackle, do you really need a guy making $10 million for one year playing right tackle when you have Yadni Kajus, you have Justin Huron, you have Stuber, who they drafted late in this draft, uh, who played a lot of snaps in the Big Ten for Michigan. Uh, can you get by cheaper there? Today, I would have to say that the Patriots are looking at, you know, we would probably like it if we can move on from Isaiah Wynn, recoup that $10.4 million. They can only do it through a trade. They cannot cut him. If they if they cut him and he doesn't play, he sits out for the whole year, they have to pay the $10.4 million. It's fully guaranteed. So the only way to get rid of that, and it comes completely off the books, there's no proration, is to trade him. And so I'm sure that's option one for the Patriots. I talked to one NFL executive last week about Isaiah Wynn, and it was basically like, yeah, good luck trying to unload that contract. Um, You know, for a guy who's average and questionable how much he likes football. So, but as we all know, Nick, it only takes one team to sustain an injury. And they're like, oh, this guy has starting experience. Let's bring him in $10 million middle of the road for a tackle. Right. We get one year out of them. We have the franchise tag if we want it. So you never know. But certainly interesting that Wynn was on the right side. And uh, it seems like they're they're going in that direction. That was my immediate thought when I saw this. I thought that the Patriots are keeping their options open. And the easiest way to do that is get somebody prepared to play left tackle, make sure that they can play left tackle. Brown has played that before. It was years ago. But if you have Brown and he looks at least average to maybe slightly above average in that spot, you've got Kajust behind him looking average, maybe slightly above average in that spot. It's easier to replace the right tackle. And you can put Haran there, who has had history there. If Kajus looks good on the left side, then you can move Kajus maybe to the right side and, and keep Brown on the left side. I just read this as them keeping their options open. And if they have an opportunity to shed Isaiah Wynn, they're going to shed him quickly. That, that's at least how I read it. And we'll see if this thing kind of continues down that road. Uh, as far as the play calling, I think that's the second biggest kind of story and question that people have. And they're looking at on Twitter. They're reading stories online. Uh, what would you see from the play calling standpoint? Of course, we've got Matt Patricia, Joe Judge, Bill Belichick. Also keeping an eye on that side of the football. What'd you see today? 
Yeah, so f- today for the first time we saw the walkie-talkies out, which allow the play caller to signal the oh, play yeah. into the quarterback's he- headsets. We had not seen that yet. Um, I guess we've advanced out. from, you know, Bill, of course, scoffed at the media for saying like, well, who, who should they be working on calling plays? And he's like, what kind of plays? Minicamp plays? Well, I guess, I guess mandatory minicamp plays are important because they actually got the walkie talkies out <laughs> and they used that. And there were four periods that they used the walkie talkies. Matt Patricia uh, used them for three of them. Joe Judge did it for seven on seven when Matt Patricia was over off to the side with the, with the offensive line. So right now you would have to say it looks like Matt Patricia is the leader in the clubhouse of being the Patriots play caller on on offense this season, which is, uh, you know, we've been discussing it all off season. We'll we'll see how this goes. You know, one thing that's interesting, I'm sure we'll talk about it more, is, you know, will Matt Patricia be on the sideline or will he be in the coach's box where he was used to calling play? Well, no, he called plays, I think, on defense on the sideline. So uh, it's all interesting. It, it it's it. it it's part of the fabric of this year's Patriots squad where we're looking at all this stuff. Belichick was mostly in a supervisory role, spent most of his time with the offense, and Joe Judge uh, most of the time was just with the quarterbacks. All right, so I have a question off of this quick here. Look, it's not about what they decided not to do, right? We're beyond that. We know what the situation is. Judge, Patricia, Belichick kind of overseeing the entire operation. Out of Patricia and Judge, not who do you think? We, we've talked about Mac Jones having one guy in his ear, and it makes sense to have that guy be Joe Judge as the quarterback's coach. It, it would seem to make sense to be you know having him as the play caller. But just looking at the individuals, Greg, just looking at Patricia and looking at Judge, who do you think has the potential to be the better play caller? To me, I would have to lean Patricia. I mean, at least we know he has experience calling plays, uh, defensive plays. But, you know, on the fly, he's right. done it. He knows what the pressure is. It's completely different, um, you know, under the gun. And, you know, if the other team's going fast, you know, what are you doing? And, and you know, that sort of thing. So, you know, Matt Patricia, he's, you know, a rocket scientist. And, you know, he's very smart. He's called plays before. As a defensive coach, at least you understand you're anticipating offensive calls from the other team. So at least he's been thinking about that right. in his career. So I'm not totally against the Matt Patricia thing. I just I just know Joe Judge's track record. It wasn't good when he was receivers coach here. It wasn't good with the Giants when he had uh, a heavy influence on their on their offense last season, you know, changing offensive coordinators and things like that. So for me, uh, I feel a little bit better that Matt Patricia can – can learn and get to the point where he's capable of doing the job. All right, let's talk about the offense in general. You know, again, I was looking at my timeline today and there was a lot of love from Mac Jones saying that this could have been, you know, again, with the context of shorts and t-shirts and there's no pads and we we know what this is, but there was a lot of love, Greg, for Mac Jones, what people saw. Uh, I, I saw multiple, multiple people that were at this uh, minicamp practice saying that this could have been the best day that they've seen Mac Jones have and that he was just on point. Uh, your thoughts on Mac and your thoughts on the offense in general today? Uh, yeah, I thought Mac overall was really good. I mean, I, I don't know. Sometimes I get the feeling that I'm watching this different practice than other people. Like, you know, I did not come away from the first day of mandatory minicamp being like, this is the greatest Mac Jones has ever looked. Not not anything close. Now, did he have four ridiculously good throws? Absolutely he did. He had a, poor, a post-corner shot play to Trey Nixon, who sort of Kendrick Bourne was not seen. Trey Nixon got a lot of run at Kendrick Bourne's spot. 60 yards over Jonathan Jones. Great, great throw, great catch. There was a... Uh, a sideline sort of one-on-one throw it up to Devontae Parker, which is his specialty over Jalen Mills. That was nice. J.J. Taylor at one point was one-on-one with a linebacker, went down the middle, did a little move. Mack tossed it right in between uh, the linebacker and the safety. uh, J.J. Taylor took it, uh, went the distance for a touchdown, and then there was another one to Jonu Smith where he made a really nice throw. Absolutely, those were dime throws, awesome throws. You know, the rest of it, a lot of it to me was check downs, flat throws, you know, and and look, 
this is a secondary that is very much in flux. I mean, I can't even tell from down to down who's in the game, who's playing what. I think there's a lot of guys getting used to it. It's also sort of three-quarter speed most of the time. I will say this. What I saw was once it was 11 on 11s and there were pass rushers, there was stuff going on in, co- in front of the quarterbacks, I thought the passing offense struggled largely. Um, you know, I, I did not have very good stats for them. I mean, I had Mac Jones two of five with three sacks slash scrambles. And, you know, yeah, one time he scrambled and threw it to J.J. Taylor, but the defense is yelling sack. I don't know if it was a sack or not. Are people counting that as a reception? I don't know. I mean, it was it took forever to get there. So, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say I, I would say it was a it was a very, it was a positive day for Mac Jones. Um you know, he showed a lot of accuracy. I do think he was frustrated during the 11 on 11s. There was some miscommunication going on. So to me, it was just a run of the mill, regular first day of mandatory mini camp practice with a lot of new people in a new offense for some, some of them. And, uh, it, it was good. I'm not ready to, you know, say, draw any conclusions from this other than Mac had four awesome, unbelievable throws and, you know, the rest of it was, you know, good, solid. Some quick hits about the uh, first mandatory minicamp practice that Greg took in today. Uh, of course, he'll have more at BSJ, bostonsportsjournal.com, uh, and, and have, I'm sure, a little bit more in depth as to what he saw. But let's talk about Devontae Parker. Uh, he had some good OTA practices from what you guys saw. Uh, what what he do today, and, and did anything stand out about his, his day, the first one mandatory minicamp for the Patriots? Yeah, he didn't uh, He didn't absurdly stand out or anything. He did have that really nice play where Mac Jones saw that it was man coverage, um, you know, sort of checked to, you know, and out and go, and they were on the same page, which was great to see. But, you know, Devontae continues to look the same. He just looks like a mature, real sort of receiver where we haven't had a lot of those in these parts. And, and certainly his physical matchup stands out or his, his physical makeup stands out compared right. to some of these other receivers on this team who are, uh, you know, I think on the awaken 180 uh, diet, you know, there are, <laughs> there are a lot of thin guys out there, uh, including uh, Tyquan Thornton. Uh, but, you know, I think he, he, he looks good. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to see how that relationship develops. You just brought him up. I know everybody listening to the podcast, they want minute to minute day to day updates on Tyquan Thornton. Uh, how much was he involved today? And, and did you see anything from him? Uh, not a lot. He was mostly on, uh, you know, sort of the scout team uh, watching him run some drills. You know, I think they're, they're working on his route running. I think it, it needs to be defined. I will say where he stands out is once he gets the ball into his hands, he really sort of scoots the next like 10, 15 yards uh, which is nice to see and something that you saw in his college film where he is, you know, he's not afraid of contact. I know there's there was some discussion about that, but I, I don't have any uh, issues with him in that regard. Of course, no pads and no tackling, uh, no thumping or anything like that. Uh, what was interesting is that he got a lot of work at Gunner on punt coverage, uh, hmm. taking some tips from Matthew Slater and including one time he got down the field and fielded it uh, cleanly in the air. So, uh, you know, something to watch for him. I'm sure a lot of people are not excited to hear about their uh, their wide receiver g- being groomed as a punt gunner, but uh, these are your New England Patriots. I'll tell you who is happy. Adam Jones, he just got a segment. Uh, let's talk about the other rookie, uh, Cole Strange. Uh, you know, when, when Strange was drafted, uh, Greg, you were one of at least a few people that brought up Logan Mankins. Like, he, you know, does he have that attitude? Does he have that kind of grind it? And Apparently he got into a middle of a little bit of a kerfuffle today with uh, Matt Judon. And, and did, did it remind you at all of, of Logan Mankins? Did you see that little feistiness from the rookie offensive lineman that you want to see? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, he's definitely, he, he's definitely a little feisty. This was at the senior bowl. He got in like post snap scuffles, like every time it's sort of what he does <laughs> is his calling card. I will say, look, I haven't studied him a lot and we'll see how it goes once we get the training camp, but you know, there are a couple times when I see him blocking a little bit where you're just like, you know, does he have enough anchor in the lower body right now? I'm sure he will in time as he develops into an NFL player. But right now, for his position and on the interior, he looks a little light. Uh, to me, we'll see if it's an issue. I could be just, you know, making a lot out of nothing. If Trent Brown is your left tackle 
and Strange is obviously expected to be the left guard. Do you like that combination on the left side? Yeah, it's interesting. That's one of my observations over at BSJ that I talked about, which is like if they go this route, because before we anticipated Isaiah Wynn and Cole Strange on the left side. Those are two highly, well, first of all, they're a little bit undersized, but highly athletic guys. So you could see, okay, yeah, pair them together. And then on the right side, you have Michael Wenu and Trent Brown, which you don't get more powerful than those guys on, on one side of the offensive line. So, you you know, you sort of looked at finesse and strength on, on either side. Now if they go Trent Brown and Cole Strange, and then they go Michael Wenu and Isaiah Wynn, now they're splitting it. So now they're more balanced. Is that better for the team? You know, is that better for the running game? Maybe. I don't know. There's certainly some – uh, positives that you could say that it's better to have that so teams can't say oh well they're just going to run around the the right side because that's their power side so but interesting at least to take a look at it do you think Belichick was maybe a little concerned with being too light in the ass on the left side you know blind side of Mac and saying to himself well Isaiah has been inconsistent and I don't know if I can bank on him and, you know, Cole Strange, one of the questions that I've read about him is pass pro, you know, especially right off the bat, was Belichick yep. looking at it and yep. saying, uh, putting, you know, putting win and Strange on the left side, blind side of my second year quarterback, a little too light. Let, let's maybe mix it up a little bit. Yeah, I do. I, I think there's some validity to that, Nick. I think it's a it's a good point and it's a good thought. And I think just also from when we've seen Trent Brown on the left side in his uh, you know previous stint with the Patriots with his just size and length he just takes a long time to get around even if he's even if he doesn't block that great on that play it's giving you an extra half second three quarters of a second that could be the difference between a completion and a sack yeah just go be a mountain Trent if, if you can't yeah. if you can't actively block the guy just get in the way of the guy and that'll mm-hmm. help us all right let's jump to the defensive side you brought up the cornerback position before I get to kind of the depth and what you see as far as who's starting and and as of right now, of course, this is all subject to change. I wanted to ask you about Jack Jones because from what I read and what I see, it seems like he's getting a little bit more activity early on than might be expected. And it also seems that he's not doing too bad and, and he's actually accounting for himself pretty well. What's your assessment, your evaluation of Jack Jones so far? Yeah, I'd say, you know, so far so good. It seems like he sort of, uh, it, again, it's hard to tell, but you know, it seems like he's been um, splitting time on the second team, um, you know, with guys like Juwan Williams and and things like that. And so I think, and and I do think he's done well. He got his hands on a pass today. Uh, he's quick as hell. He's slippery. He's skinny. Um, you know, can he hold up? And you know, with that frame, we'll have to see. But I think he's off to a good start. Whereas you know, Marcus Jones, who was drafted ahead of him. Uh, who at the last mini camp we saw he was playing more safety. He's in the red jersey. Was with, with with the rehab group. So Jack Jones is getting a chance to 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 show what he can do. But I do think you know some of the you know to me uh, the predominant cornerback groupings were Jalen Mills, Terrence Mitchell, and Jonathan Jones with the first group with Jack Jones, Malcolm Butler, and Miles Bryant. So I, it seems like they're really tossing these guys into a hat and seeing what might work, getting it on film, and then they can look at it and say, hey, what do we like, what do we not like about these different personnel groupings? Doesn't make me feel great. Um, Of course, we were looking at this position, and you know me, I'm not – I know there are certain analytics and stuff like that that will tell you that Jalen Mills was pretty good last year, but I just think him being one of your, you know, top two outside corners is iffy, especially if you don't have a true number one corner like a J.C. Jackson was last season – but we'll see how it shakes out. You know, positive things have been said about Malcolm Butler. Can he kind of hold on to that momentum as we move forward? We'll have to wait and see. But cornerback is obviously one of the biggest questions about this team, where guys will fall and how they'll play. Um, I don't, I don't, I get so tired of bringing this guy up at this point, but I'm going to ask you because he's somebody that people want to know about. Nikhil Harry was out there. Nikhil Harry was actually, uh, actually at the practice facility today. He was actually on the field. Uh, any thoughts about him, Greg? Not really. He looks like the same player. <laughs> he, was re- he was relegated to scout team. Um, you know, I think they're basically just playing out the string with him um, until we get to it. You know, his, his route running sort of looked the same. Um, 
And he was, I will say, he was with the receivers. I know there's been some talk about him moving to the tight end. It was something you and I talked about like a year ago. What do you do with Nikhil Harry? Like, does he even fit at wide receiver? So they try him at like move tight end. To this point, we have seen no indication that the Patriots are going to do that. One last thing that I wanted to ask you offensively, there's been a lot of talk about the terminology. And I know that Bill said this morning that, look, we're not changing our offensive scheme. We're just changing the terminology. We're, we're trying to simplify things. We're trying to streamline things. Uh, your read on that, and, and you've mentioned the zone blocking scheme that we've seen s- some of early on here. What do you think's happening, like overall big picture to this offense? Just your, your general feel as far as terminology, some of the different quirks we've seen, no fullback, you know, John o. Smith's usage. How funky could things get this year? Yeah, I, you know, we, we definitely did see in the OTAs, we saw more sort of um, zone scheme stuff, the Kyle Shanahan stuff. We did not see much of that today. It looked like regular run-of-the-mill Patriots offense. Uh, who knows what the next two days bring? Um, yeah, I do think, I think Bill was largely being honest today when he talked about, um, you know, they're mostly just streamlining some things, some terminology, things like that. I do think it it might be for the benefit of the play callers who are, you know, new to this, trying to and, – and also the players who are largely new to this scheme, uh, at least in the past couple of years. Um, but I don't think they're trying to reinvent the wheel or anything like that. I think that, you know, Bill talking about, like, you know, when you have coaches and players who have been here for, like, 20 years – you know, it gets really layered up to like, they know what they're talking about, but the people who just walked in the door don't really know. So I think they're trying to streamline it. That's good in theory. And the coaches might have the best intentions, but the only thing I'm worried about is how does Mac Jones want it? Because he's the quarterback. He's the guy who's got to disseminate it. So I'm less worried about accommodating Matt Patricia and Joe judge I want to, I want to tailor to Mac Jones. So whatever he wants to do, if he wants to stick with what Josh McDaniels told him, do that and figure it out uh, rather than slow Mac Jones down along with everybody else. Fascinating times. Lots of questions. We'll see if we get any answers. He's Greg Omnick. We're back tomorrow. We are back the rest of this week. We'll have an episode for you every single day for the uh, remaining week here on Mandatory Minicamp. It's the Greg Bedard Patriots podcast with Nick Cattles brought to you by betonline.ag. Fastest, easiest way to bet all of your favorite sports. Be good, be healthy, be safe. We'll talk to you tomorrow.